If you have your Bibles, please turn to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, uh, we started last week going through this amazing book. And I'd like to begin just by reading from Exodus chapter 2, uh, beginning with verses 23 through 25 at the end of the chapter. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. During those many days, the king of Egypt died. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that even in dark, hard and difficult times. You see us. Lord, you know us. You know our name. You know all the difficulties and hardships that we face. And Lord, you are able to remedy those problems. You are more than able to bring deliverance and salvation for us. And so Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from your word today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I heard a story from an old pastor. Uh, it was a man telling a story about this pastor, Gardner Taylor, who has passed away now. He was uh, a pastor in New York City around the time of the Depression. And uh, he went down to a church in Louisiana to preach at a revival. And he said at that time, electricity was just coming to that area. And so in the sanctuary, they had a single bulb coming down to illuminate the whole sanctuary. And they were meeting at night. They had this single bulb. And he was preaching away, going, going, going. And then the light went out. The power was gone. And they were in complete darkness. And the man sat there. And he was a young preacher. And he sat there. And he didn't really know what to do. He didn't know how to proceed. So he was quiet on the stage, and out of the darkness, he heard someone call out, Preach on, preacher. We can still see Jesus in the dark. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but in dark and hard times that we might face in this life, we can still see Jesus. And the good news of the gospel is that even in the midst of those hard times, even when it is so dark that we can't see the future, we can't see what's ahead of us, God sees us. And he knows our pain, and he cares about us, and he can fix that situation. In Exodus chapter 1, it ends for the people of Israel on a low note. Pharaoh had just pronounced that any Hebrew boy is to be thrown into the Nile River and killed. It is Dark times indeed for the people of Israel. And God sees them. And he knows them. And he cares about them. And today, I don't know what dark time you might be facing in life. I don't know what relationship is broken that needs to be mended. I don't know if you have maybe lost your job and you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. I don't know if you struggle with anxiety or depression or it feels like darkness is closing in on you, but I want to tell you that God sees you. He knows you and he can deliver you from that situation. And in those hard and dark times, we can still keep looking for Jesus and we can see him in the dark. And so today I have four things for us to do when we are in the midst of darkness. Four things to do in darkness. First, when in darkness or dark times, we can act in faith even when we can't see the future. We can act in faith even when we can't see the future. Look at Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds in the riverbank. Moses' mother was in a dark time. She has this baby boy and she has to hide him for three months. Can you imagine? And for three months, she's telling that baby to be quiet. 
And for three months, she's trying to keep him quiet so that Pharaoh doesn't come and throw her baby boy in the river. It is hard and dark times. And in dark times, we can do a number of things. We can wallow in it, and we can cry out and say, God, why me? God, why have you put me in this situation? Why would you allow this to happen? And we can wallow in those dark times. The second thing we can do is we can get angry at God. We can say, God, you shouldn't have done this. You're wrong for doing this, God. We can get angry, and we can get mad at God, and we can lash out at Him. And I don't know, maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been angry at God for putting you in a dark situation in life. I think neither of those options are what we are called to do. And I think we see in Moses' mother the right answer, the right response. What does she do? She acts in faith. She gets to work. She doesn't sit there and do nothing, but she does something. It says that she made a basket. She made this basket, and she put her son in it, and she went and put him in the river. And I've been thinking about this, and I'm sure many of you, if you've grown up in church, have heard this story before. And you have this image, this picture in your mind of baby Moses in a basket just floating down the Nile River, right? Right in the middle, and he's floating, and he's going to just get to the Mediterranean Sea, right? Just go out to sea. And the more I thought about this passage, the more I thought that that wouldn't have been a solution for Moses' mother, would it? To just leave the baby floating down out into the Mediterranean Sea, right? Because he wouldn't have been able to survive. But it says that she went and she put him among the reeds by the bank. And you can imagine that she didn't know what to do, and she didn't know what God was going to do, but she said, I'm going to do something. And we know that she acted in faith, because in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, when he tells us about the faith of these amazing people in the Old Testament, it says this in Hebrews 11, 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, for they saw that he was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, she stepped out. She said, I'm going to do something. If he stays here with me, he will likely die, and so I'm going to make this a basket, and I'm going to put it among the reeds, and I'm going to let go. Can you imagine how hard it would have been for Moses' mother to let go of that basket? As I've read this and thought about it, it really reveals a lot about her faith. Because for you and me, we like to act in dark times, but we don't want to let go. What Moses' mother teaches us here is that we act and we do everything we can and then we let go and we say, God, I'm going to need you to work. God, I'm going to need you to do something miraculous. God, I'm going to put my faith in you that you can act in the middle of this. And boy, does God act. But before we move on, I do want to note this. The word here for basket, this word in the Hebrew is only used one other time in the entire Old Testament. And it's found in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. It is used in that particular story. You know what story that is? The story of Noah. And that word that is used here and translated as basket is the same word for ark. And can you imagine Moses' mother putting together this ark and thinking about Moses and the faith that Moses had? When no one else believed that God was going to send the flood, and still Moses went out and he built this ark. And he said, God, are you going to make this happen? And he went every day, and by faith, he built the ark. And then what did Noah do? Noah went and he got on the ark, and who shut the door? God shut the door, and God protected him. And I've got to believe that Moses' mother is thinking about Noah, and she's thinking about the faith that he had. And she said, I'm going to put this together, and I'm going to put it in water that is meant for death that everyone is using to kill these babies. And I'm going to put it here and I'm going to trust that God can work. Amen. And look what happens. Verse 4. 
And his sister, Moses' sister, stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Again, Moses' sister is acting in faith. She goes and she's standing along the bank to see what would happen. And then she sees Pharaoh's daughter come right to where that basket is. Can you imagine the dread in her heart? The baby killer's daughter is here. And she's going to be the one to find this child. Can you imagine how fearful she would have been? But look at what happens through God's providence and through God's sovereign hand. Look at verse 6. When Pharaoh's daughter opened it, she saw the child and the whole baby was crying. And look at this. She took pity on him. She said, I'm going to take pity on this Hebrew child that my father wants to kill. And I'm going to adopt him as my own. That's how God works. And at just that time, the sister comes out and she tells Pharaoh's daughter, she says, I know someone who can nurse him for you. And she says, okay, great, take him to her and I will pay you for doing so. And so the sister takes Moses back to his mother and his mother gets paid to take care of him. Isn't that how God works? Isn't that how God can work in a dark and difficult and hard situation if we step out in faith and let go and let God take control. And look at the close of this section in verse 10. It says, When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. What a fitting name for Moses, who was in the water, and she pulls him out and saves him. And then we are going to get to Exodus chapter 14 when Moses is old and he is leading God's people out of the water of the Red Sea and delivering them and saving them. Isn't it amazing how God works? I don't know what hard or dark time you're in right now, but what we see from Moses' mother is that all you can do is take a step of faith. Keep taking steps towards Jesus every day. You don't know what's going to happen with that sickness that you have. You don't know what's going to happen with your job. You don't know what's going to happen with these relationships. But every day you can get up and you can take a step towards Jesus. You can take a step of faith and say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but in faith I'm going to keep taking steps towards you, trusting that you are in control. So in darkness we can act in faith even when we can't see the future. Number two, when in darkness, we can patiently seek to be sanctified. We can patiently seek to be sanctified. So Moses is uh, a child with his mother, and then probably when he's older, six or seven, he goes and he's adopted into Pharaoh's family, right? And he is the, he is the child of Pharaoh's daughter. And he grows up, and 40 years pass, and when Moses is 40 years old, we get to Verse 11 it says, one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. So Moses knew that he was a Hebrew. He, he knew where his lineage, lineage was and his heritage was from, and he saw his people. And in Acts chapter 7, we have another glimpse of, uh, of this happening in verse uh, 22 of Acts chapter Seven it says, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was forty years old, it came to his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. So Moses is wise. He is mighty in word and deed. He's 40 years old. You could probably say he was at his prime. And at this point in his life, he looks and he says, God's calling me to be the person to lead them out of slavery. But Moses comes and he doesn't handle this situation in the right way. Look at what he does. Verse 11, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses says, I'm going to take charge. I'm going to deliver my people. And I'm going to come and I see this injustice on my people. And I'm going to look and I'm going to make sure no one's watching. And he kills the Egyptian. The same word in Hebrew for beating 
and were struck. The Egyptian was beating the Hebrew, and Moses struck the Egyptian. It's the same word in Hebrew. Moses says, if you do this to my people, I will do this to your people. He takes matters into his own hands. And look how it goes for him. He goes to his people, the other Hebrews, and he says, why are you fighting against each other? And they reject him. They say, what are you doing? Are you the judge and prince over us? Do you mean to kill us as you killed the Egyptian? And at this point, Moses knows that he's been found out. He knows that the Pharaoh will come and kill him. And so Moses has to flee. And he goes to this place in Midian, in the wilderness. Isn't this how things go when we try and take matters into our own hands? When we try and solve problems that only God can solve. Moses was at his prime, at his peak. And then when he takes matters into his own hands to do things his own way, not acting in faith, but acting in the way he wants to act, it doesn't go well. Moses then has to flee and go to the land of Midian. And there he has lost everything and he is alone in Midian. Moses needed to be sanctified. He thought he was ready for the task God had called him to, but he needed to be Sanctified. God needed to work on him. I uh, had the privilege of doing some premarital counseling uh, this week, and it's always fun when I have the opportunity to meet with young couples who are about to get married. Um, and I told them uh, that marriage is a sanctifying process. Uh, if you're married in here, you can probably agree with that, that it's not easy getting married and living your life together. And I told them that when Katie and I first got married, uh, we got into a lot of fights our first year. The first year of marriage was the toughest for me and Katie. Katie looked at me and she says, where's this thing going? I don't know. And so anyways, we got into a lot of fights our first year. And it was over silly stuff. Stuff that I wasn't ready for because I needed to be sanctified. It was things like this. I would ask Katie, I would say, hey, where do you want to eat? And she said, I'll eat anywhere. No problem. Any, anything you want to eat tonight is fine. And so I'd say, well, how about Subway? Know about but anywhere else is fine. Okay, how about most? Uh, anywhere else is fine. So at that point, that first year, I would get in a fight. But now I know just to bring some crackers when we're deciding where we want to eat, right? Or, or how about this, guys? Do you know in the kitchen uh, by the oven there is a little rack there? And you can hang a hand towel on it. So if you wash your hands, you can go to the hand towel and dry them off. But apparently, gentlemen. There is something known as a decorative hand towel, and that is not to be touched. You are not to touch that decorative hand towel. <laughs> and now I'm learning that I'm, I'm going to be in trouble when we get home. But, but anyways, I needed to be sanctified in our marriage because I would pick fights and get upset and be mad over these things. And marriage taught us that it's not about what I want, but it's about putting the other person first and their needs. And Moses found out that he needed to be sanctified. That it's not about what he wants and what he wants to do, but it is about God and his plan and submitting to God's plan and not his own. And so he goes into Midian and while he is at this well, uh, there are these daughters of the priest of Midian and they come up and look at verse 17 of Exodus chapter says, the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. You have two pictures of injustice. Two different scenarios where there is this injustice. And Moses handles it in two different ways. One ends with an Egyptian buried in the sand. And the other ends with these women being saved. Moses needed to be sanctified. Moses eventually marries one of these women, Zipporah, and look at verse 22. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Moses ended up altogether in the wilderness out in Midian for 40 years. So he was 40 years old when he left Egypt, and he stayed in Midian for another 40 years. And during that time, you know what God was doing? Was sanctified. Moses became a shepherd out there. And he had to tend to the flock. 
And wouldn't you know that God is preparing him because one day he would lead a flock of people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And he would have to know how to lead them and how to shepherd these people and care for them. And God was sanctifying him through this. If you are in a dark time today, I need you to ask, how is God sanctifying me through it? In the midst of his pain, in the midst of his trouble and tribulation, how is God using this so that I can bring him glory? How is he shaping me and changing me so I can give God glory? So in darkness, we can act in faith. We can seek to be sanctified. Number three, in darkness, we can trust in God's character. We can trust in God's character. When we face dark times, we can be quick to malign God's character. We can be quick to jump and say, has God forgotten us? Does God care about us? The people of Israel had been enslaved for generations. And you would think they would cry out and say, God, where are you? I don't trust you anymore. I don't trust that you're coming for me. I don't trust that you're going to be able to do anything for me. And they align God's character. So look again at these verses that I read at the beginning. Look at verse 23. During those days, many, the, during those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery. And they cried out for help. And their cry for rescue came from slavery up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. Saw the blood and he knew. There's two things that I take away from this verse. First is that you can cry out to God. You can be vulnerable with him. He wants to hear from you, and you can cry out. You can say, God, I'm hurting right now. God, it's a dark time right now. God, I need you to act. They cried out for help. But what did they not do? They didn't go against his character. They cried out, trusting that there was a God who could do something. It, trusting in him. And it says here that God remembered his covenant. He heard him, he remembered, and he knew. And we look at that and we think he remembered that God forgives. And I don't think this is teaching us that God is forgetful, but rather that God is about to act. I heard a story about these uh, gentlemen. They, uh, they were a young group of 30-year-olds. And they were wanting to get together because they had all gotten married and moved away. And they have families now. And they said, every so often, we need to get the guys back together. And we need to go out to eat. And so when they were all about 30 years old, uh, they got together. And somebody said, where should we go eat? And they said, we need to go to Glowing Embers Restaurant. I hear that they have some beautiful waitresses there. And so they go out and they eat at Glowing Embers Restaurant. And then about 15 years later, they're 45 years old, and they say, hey, we need to get together again. And they say, where should we go? And one guy said, let's go to Glowing Embers. I hear the food and the drink is really good. Let's go there. And so they go there and have a good time. And then when they are 60 years old, another 15 years have passed, they say, where should we go out to eat? And they say, let's go to Glowing Embers Restaurant. I hear that it's really peaceful and smoke-free. So they go and they celebrate. Another 15 years pass, and they are 75 years old. And they said, where should we go this time? And one of them said, let's go to Glowing Embers. I hear that it's physically accessible. They got, a, they got an health baby now. They got all these things. This is important. This is what the 75-year-olds need to hear, right? And then 15 years later, they're 90 years old. And they say, you know what? Where should we all go to eat? We're all 90 years old. And one of them said, I think we should go to Glowing Embers Restaurant. I don't think I've ever been there before. <laughs> <laughs> we are quick to forget, aren't we? We are people and we are fallible and we can forget and we can have trouble remembering. But guess what? God never forgets. God always remembers. And this passage right here, it says God remembered. This word, this phrase that is used all throughout the scripture when it says God remembers his covenant, it means he's about to act. It means that he has been seeing it all happen and now he is choosing to act upon the covenant that he has made. And we see in the next verses, God appears to Moses in a burning bush. God sees 
And I love verse 25. He saw them and he knew. He knew their suffering, but he also knew that he was going to do something about it. And for you, if you were in a dark time, if you were in a hard time, know that God sees your suffering and he knows it, but he's also made a way for you to escape it, a way for you to get through it and get out of it. Finally, I want to close with our fourth, fourth point. When in darkness, we can find our identity in Christ. In dark and hard times, the thing that is going to get you through is to be found in Christ. When you know that you are in Christ, this changes everything. I want to go back to Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Moses, uh, he, he handled things the wrong way by killing the Egyptian, but it reveals something about Moses' heart. He recognized that he was God's child. That he was a part of God's people. And I want to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. Hebrews 11, verse 24 says this. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. Did you catch that? Moses could have been the prince of Egypt. He could have had wealth and power and prestige, and yet he looked on God's people and he said, I want to identify with God's people. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he would rather be mistreated and enslaved as a child of God than all the treasures of Egypt. Why? Because they were fleeting pleasures of sin. And for you here today, if you want to get through these dark and hard times, the only way is to be found in Christ. The world can only offer you fleeting pleasures. They will be here today and gone tomorrow. But Jesus, what he can give us, is an eternity of joy with him. You know, Moses is a picture that points us to Jesus. Moses came and he wanted to deliver his people. In verse 14, they said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? And they cast him out. They rejected Moses. And God sent another deliverer. Years later, named Jesus. And he was also born as a miraculous birth. And if you remember, King Herod was killing all of the baby boys at that time. And Jesus had to flee. And he was rescued as a baby. And then Jesus came to his own people. And he tried to teach them how to have eternal life. And what did they do to Jesus? They rejected him. But where Moses escaped, left, Jesus stayed. Jesus stayed and was spit upon. He was mocked and he was hung on a tree. And he could have been their prince and judge. He could have exercised that power and said, I will judge you and I will roll over you. But instead, he chose to die on their behalf. Amen. The question for us today is in dark times, we reject this Jesus who has come to deliver us or will we accept him and the eternal life that he offers us? If you are here today and you are not a Christian, I want to beg you, I want to plead with you to accept Jesus today. To trust in him as your deliverer. In these hard times that you face, the fleeting pleasures of this world will not last and they will not get you through. But only by trusting in Jesus and his sacrifice can you be delivered. If you are here today and you are a Christian, I invite you to cry out to Jesus. Cry out to him while trusting that he is a good God with good character. Cry out to him and tell him that you need him to sanctify you, to make you new, to shape you in these hard times. And cry out to him and ask him, Lord, how can I act in faith even in this hard and dark time? Trust in Jesus to be your deliverer. Father, you are good to us.
You have given us Christ. You have given us our Redeemer. And Lord, I pray right now that we would not reject you. Lord, that we wouldn't turn from you, but we would accept you as our Lord. That we would trust in you. Lord, that we would cry out to you and you would show us what it means to have faith and to act in faith, even in hard and difficult times. Lord, I pray for those in this room who are going through these dark and difficult times. And Lord, I pray that you would draw near to them, that you would wrap yourself around them, and they would know your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation.